Hello, and welcome to Thursday the 8th of July. That's a fun thing to say, and this is the first video of today. And this is all about Denby Castle. It's part 9 of 14, and it's of course about Long Patrol from the Ring of Stone. Ring of Iron, name Ring of Stone. Sorry. So, this is the joy of recording this stuff while on the move. I left some of these to record while on the move, principally as an extra experiment to see if I could actually record them when moving because um, that takes some of the pressure off preparing these research, uh, the stuff for when I'm on the research trips, if I could do some of the recording when I'm on the research trip. But that's going off on one before I begin. So, today's topic is of course Denby Castle, which I have spelled correctly. Dyslexic worrying moment then. Now as you can see, it's quite a substantial ruin that's left of this castle, and it was a very substantial castle when it was built. But honestly, the castle itself is only part of the construction. Denby Castle, like Aberystwyth, is a heavily fortified place. It's also, the first one we've got to, which is part of the second tranche of construction. Because as you know, all the castles up to this point have been started in 1277. Denby Castle is started in 1283, along with Carnarvon, Conwy and Harlech. And really, these castles come about as a reaction to what has happened to the... How do I put this? To the rebellion, the attempts by Daffid to retake, or rather to get back control of certain areas. Um, Daffid or Grufford had actually been granted Perfordwald, uh, where Denby Castle was, as part of the settlement in 1277. And Daffid rebuilt it and actually created the original uh, 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 created a castle on this site however Daffid of course if uh, leads the rebellion against well how to put this is very dissatisfied with what he's got in terms of settlement after 1277 so in 1282 he starts an uprising in the Easter by attacking other castles of Edwards and Llewellyn is basically forced to back him up. Unfortunately for Daffid and Llewellyn, Edward comes into North Wales with a huge army, including a huge number of Southern Welsh. And what a settlement which was originally called Dinbeck, Dinbeck, or Dinbeck, Dinby, perhaps, um, Uh, considered an abbreviation of Dinis Fenech Fecken, which means little fortress, falls to Edward's forces quite quickly. Edward grants the lands to Henry de Lacy, Earl of Lincoln. One of the conditions that he grants the lands to Edward de Lacy on, uh, on is that he will allow James of St. George to build the castle for him. And this castle is going to be built on top of this former castle of Daffords. So it's one of the it's one of the ones built in land. Definitely, it's, you know, it's not connected to sea, it's not near a river. This is definitely one of those castles which should be arguing against what the case I've been making. But, as you see, as we get through this, you will see that there's more subtlety there. Henry de Lacy takes over completing this castle and completing this work and really does devote a whole load of stuff to it. He gives the new town a chart, he creates a new town and gives it a chart, makes it a charter town, which gives it some protection. And town walls are just as critical as the castle walls. 
because the point about this castle and this town is that they were to secure the area. However, you can tell it's a noble castle rather than a royal castle because by 1294, 12 years later, the castle hasn't been completed when uh, Madoc Ap Llewellyn decides to revolt and the castle is taken despite Henry de Lacy himself trying to relieve it and it takes until December of 1294 for the castle to be re recovered. The castle is in a fairly critical position. This castle, how do I put this, is still to this day the centre of Denbyshire, which is a county in Wales, for a reason. This was the critical hub point. That's what the uh, Edwards plan was developing. That's why he wanted Henry de Lacy in charge of it. He wanted it developed as a hub point to bind the area together and stabilize it remember as i've said before edward's thing is stability he wants security he wants peace he doesn't want to have to keep dealing with noble uprisings like his father faced he doesn't want to have borders which are keep erupting into warfare and raiding it annoys him he's got enough to do with dealing with the french down south without dealing with the Scots and the uh, the Welsh as well, which is why he's try he would try to be quite as generous as he was, and there are going to be many heels down there go. No, his twelve seventy seven deal wasn't generous, by our standards no, but by medieval standards, if you compare it to other potential treaties, he's very generous. For starters, he lets them live, leaves them with lands they control and are in charge of, leaves them with their titles. These are quite big things in this time. He wanted peace and stability. He wanted to be able to concentrate on other things. And he was building castles to prefer, preserve that peace and stability by as a deterrent factor. I would say the second phase is more about control. He's given up trying to deter the lords and work with the local lords. He's now replacing them. So, here is the construction of the castle. And the first thing you're going to notice is that lovely tri tower main gate. Seriously, you know, it's made up of prison tower, the porter's lodge tower, and the bishop's uh, and the badness tower. It's just hugely powerful. It's a gatehouse, a keep, a fortification, all in of itself. And it looks out over the town, which means it both serves as a reminder to those people in the town of the strength of the Lord, because you look up at that and you see this massive great big fortification and think, that place isn't going to fall. But also, if you're looking from outside the town, that's looking over the town like a sort of protective position. And this is a very strong castle design. Thanks to the position it is in, again, if we consider the hill, the rise, and the other, or the extended town wall around it, it's almost a concentric castle with multiple layers. It can also be made a case of it being a sort of extended modern bailey castle. It is certainly a well-built fortification. And designed to be such. As we can see from the town's design though, that is a far, a, a seemingly less complicated wall, but its very existence and shape divines the town. 
it defines the protected space and it defines what's being protected. The history is kind of interesting. As said, there had already been some construction there put there by Daffid. Um, Daffid up Grafford, Grafford. Uh, brother of Prince Llewellyn up Grufford, prior to Edward's constructions. But that had been lost. When with Henry de Lacy being left in charge using James St. George, James St. George as his as chief advisor in construction and using local labourers and men brought from Henry's estates in England, the western and southern sides of the castle, new town walls were built first in order to protect the construction teams and so by 1285 Henry was, uh, Henry was able to give the town, that's Henry de Lacy, was able to give the town his first charter. The rest of the defences continued, as said, to be worked on till 1294, and still not complete by then. But the castle and town formed part of a wider area, which was controlled by the Lacey now. He added a manor, a dovecot, barn, fish ponds, all the important symbols of lordship and status, along with parks around the castle stocked with deer brought from England. The walls, the town walls, enclosed an area of approximately 3.8 hectares on 9.5 acres and held 63 burgesses in 1285. Each of these promised to provide an armed man to help protect the settlement. So theoretically you have about 120 odd soldiers you can call on or people you can call on to fight because the burgesses should fight them uh, should be able to fight themselves as well as provide a man, a man for the garrison the townsfolk were english again drawn from henry de lacy's estates in northern england and reinforced by further english colonists who had acquired lands of area of rural land around the region now, sometimes these colonists are a bit interesting because we use the phrase English colonists and that comes up in a lot. But often, quite a lot of them are people who are English-Welsh, as we might think of it if we're looking at normal terms, in that they had started, they were coming from southern Wales and were family, were descendants of people who had moved to southern Wales and had married locals and intermarried and so they're coming north because that's a new area remember what i said i said previously about southern wales have been under normanish control i would say more than english control for quite a while since impartially since the norman conquests of england and, and wales uh, this is again something you have to think around sometimes the phrase is used english settlers and really it's more than not the Welsh who live there. They're bringing in people from regions controlled by the English crown. But that doesn't necessarily mean English as we would define it today. After 1294 and after Madoc Llewellyn's incident where he'd taken the castle and then it had to be recaptured, the castle defences were improved. Although it's not really finished because of Henry's eldest son dies in an accident at the castle. And so it's Henry de Lacy's daughter Alice who inherits the Denby Castle and is death in 1311. Alice was married to Thomas, the Earl of Lancaster, and therefore the Earl of Lancaster was a very powerful person at this point. Unsurprisingly, if you consider what happened later on in the Wars of the Roses. But this Lancaster, well, he managed to get executed for treason in 1322. 
The following years, politically unstable, and the castle passes between several owners, including Hugh de Spencer, the Earl of Winchester, and just there, and then Roger Mortimer, the Earl of March, before being held for a period by William Montague. Eventually, the Mortimer family reacquires the lordship in 1355, carries out repairs over the next 50 years to the council's fabric, and maintain it. However, in 1400, Owen Glendare leads another revolt against the crown and raids the town of Denby. Doesn't manage to get into the castle, though. The trouble is, at this point, Edwin Mortimer was only eight years old. So, that was not really an adult to go and lead the Mortimer armies and the Mortimer forces to defend their uh, town and their holdings. So, Henry IV places Henry Percy in charge of Denby until Percy defects to the rebels in 1403. Denby, though, remains in royal hands through to the end of the rebellion in 1407, despite its commander um, changing sides and despite being isolated. Edmund Mortimer hold, continues to hold the char castle until he dies childless in 1425, when ownership passes to the then Richard, Duke of York. Then we get, of course, the Wars of the Roses, which, well, Denby is fought over by Lancastrian and Yorkist factions. And it's actually the Lancastrian victory at the Battle of Bufford Bridge, which eventually allows Jasper Tudor, the Earl of Pembroke, uh, to force the garrison to surrender and take possession of the castle in 1460. Then, of course, the wars of the Tudors, uh, the, the Wars of the Roses do like to go back and forwards. The Yorkist gets into power. William Herbert, Jasper's rival for the title of Earl of Pembroke, is then made constable and steward of Denby in 1467. And so Jasper returns to Denby in 1468 and can't take the castle, but he does burn the interior of the walled town. Which is what leads to the inner town, uh, the walled town area being pretty much abandoned and becoming de facto the external defense of the castle, pretty much. Uh, with especially the Burgess Gate, which we're talking about, becoming effectively the town jail. In 1586, the antiquarian William Camden would ob could observe that the old town is now deserted. At one point, Robert Dudley, become the Earl, uh, who of course becomes the Earl of Leicester, was granted a lease of the castle in 1563, and he built a large church in the town, possibly intending it to become a cathedral, and carried out some minor repairs in the castle. But when he dies in 1588, little's been done. Then we have the Civil War, and frankly. Things don't go great there, but again, it does hold out quite well when it has to be besieged. But eventually, General George Monk has it slighted and put beyond military use. And 18th to 21st centuries, well, there's been a grammar school built in the walled town in 1726. A bowling green was established around 1769. Castle House, all sorts of things were have been put in there. But interestingly enough, Denby Castle gets a lot of work done to maintain its history. And in the middle mid 19th century, about 1860, the town creates a castle committee to maintain the ruins. And by 1879, the crown had leased the committee control of the castle and lent them 300 pounds to fund repairs to the ruins. 
the crown eventually reclaims control of Burgess Gate from its occupants the cr uh, and carries out conservation work before then leasing that gatehouse to the committee in 1908. And in 1914, the central government's Office of Works took over responsibility for the site, and this meant that during the late 1950s, the Ministry of Works bought and then demolished various later buildings along the walls to clear the area for research and visitors. The site it is now a scheduled ancient monument, and the castle is a Grade One listed building. And what you've been looking at the whole time is, well, I've been talking about this, hopefully if it stayed right, is a picture from 1750 showing the walls having they, after they had been slighted, which of course meant that gunpowder was packed in the various points and blown up to make them impossible to defend. But you can really get a sort of sense of the scale and what we're talking about. And you can also see the size of the old church and why some people think he might have been trying to build a cathedral. I think possibly not. I think... And this is going to sound potentially strange. I think he was going for one level down. And I have a reason for this. I think he was going for something like a priory. Or a large central church. Because cathedrals come with bishops. And a bishop would be rival for here, the power in the region. So I don't think Leicester would have wanted it to be a cathedral. But he wanted to have the church powerful prominent and most importantly on his side he wanted to have a position which was very advantageous to be able to grant to up-and-coming young vicars priests vicars at this point basically uh, to be able to grant them a living of suitable size and status that would bind them to him and give him further influence over the population I think a cathedral will be problematic. We have a picture of Denby Gate and Castle's gatehouse as it stands today, as we can see it now. You can get an impression of its size and its scale. And then you realise that the Burgess Gate, which stands quite well now, is a pale imitation in many ways of what that was. That was colossal. Finally, geography time. Okay, so I've just said this is in the middle of the area and it has no connection to the sea. So, how am I going to make the case? Well, we've already been over Rutland Castle which you can get to the sea and is very strongly designed to be able to be resupplied from the river and is a very very strong point a point you can land an army at quite easily and if we consider how eventually Denby Castle is relieved after it's been captured etc other things that is where a lot of the logistics comes from sometimes the troops come from Flint Castle and Hadwa Castle directions but the supplies and logistics come from Rudlam, which is roughly three hours walk away. There you go. See, you can have a supposedly isolated internal castle on a maritime system, as long as you have those strong maritime castles close enough that you can resupply and reinforce them so you can turn up to the land ones quickly enough. Because, if you think about it, you can bring your ships in with the tide to Rodlan. Land. Probably take a half a day getting your troops ashore. The rest of the day, you can pick, you can either choose to rest them and then advance on Denby Castle the next day, with a full day to do it. Or you might decide to dash in and do it straight in at the straight down with the half day you have left. It doesn't matter. It's up to you. The thing is, you have options because you are close enough. So what have we got to come out? 
we have patrons. The two winners have been chosen. 28 and 29. Pa 28 is Aaron Evans, the original cruisers, Royal Navy frigates in the Age of Sail, with 19 votes, I think, from memory. And the winner was patron 29, Wayne Borin, coastal defence ships, the theory design operational defence differences between navies, with 20 votes. Long patrols we have come up. Well, we have Robert Calder, we have the Battle of Lisa, and then we have the Patron Inspired series. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed. Thank you to everyone who has watched the videos. Thank you to everyone who likes them and shares them. Thank you to everyone who is a patron, and thank you to everyone who's joined the channel, and thank you to everyone who does super chats. You've made my research trips possible. You've made my research possible. You've made the work I'm doing possible. Thank you. Hope you enjoy. I hope you enjoy the series.